Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. For anyone having difficulty joining, we will be waiting until two minutes after our regularly scheduled time to begin the webinar. That'll be 32 minutes after the hour or one minute and 50 seconds from now. Dave, while we have the nice people wait, would you like to play a, a little jam? Oh, <laughs> uh, sure. Doug wanted to hear, Doug, Doug misses, Doug misses his home, and he asked for this. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be beginning in one minute. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you, go ahead. one guitar. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be beginning in forty seconds. Andrew asks, "What am I drinking?" This is Schweppes sparkling water. Ladies and gentlemen, the presentation will begin in 10 seconds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the introduction to color and color management, uh, color measurement by Dave Weibel and myself, Doug Peterson. In today's presentation, we'll be breaking the presentation into two parts. As the official baby color scientist of the two of us, I will be presenting on a set of topics, uh, followed by Dave, who will be doing some heavier topics as the actual color scientist. That is a picture of my 11-month-old uh, daughter, Harper. So my topics will be color as a human sensation, talking about the fundamental nature of color and light, and then Dr. Weibel will be presenting on mathematical constructs of color. That is, how do you describe and measure color outside of its use in human sensation? So as a obligation of my participation and membership in the American Guild of Presenters, I am obligated to provide a definition slide with the dictionary entry. So here is my definition slide, color is a sensation created in a viewer by the combination of the physical object, the light falling on it, and the physiology and psychology, uh, physiolog physiological and psychological response of the viewer. So that is in short, that color is the combination of light, the object, your eye, and your mind. And so my presentation will break down each of those four components, starting with light. When we use the word light in the context of color, we are almost always talking about the visible spectrum, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now it's important to understand that that is a continuous uninterrupted spectrum from gamma rays that are the size of fractions of an atom over to long radial waves that are literally miles long in wavelength. And this fairly narrow, fairly specific band of the electromagnetic spectrum that we call visible light or the visible spectrum is the only part, the only contribution to the human sensation of color. So why is that? Why don't we have a sense of electromagnetic radiation above or below that? Well, there's two main reasons for that. The first is that in order to use something for a sense, you have to have it available. And in the entire electromagnetic spectrum, most electromagnetic radiation gets absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere before it reaches you know, us human beings and other animals. The visible light part of the spectrum does make it all the way through the atmosphere and makes it down to us so that we can look outside and see green grass. And that light is being emitted by the sun and makes it through the atmosphere. So it's useful to us. We could not do that, for example, with x-rays because x-rays aren't making it to the surface of the earth. 
There's also a second reason, and that is, even if X-rays made it to the Earth from outer space, X-rays have the propensity to go through things, right? That's why we use them in medical imaging. They can go straight through your body. So you can imagine you could not see somebody else that you either loved or wanted to run away from and survive from if they were being illuminated by X-rays unless the X-rays were coming from directly behind them. So that would not be all that useful as a evolutionary thing for us to be able to see in X-rays. X-ray vision, actually, unless you had an X-ray emitter, Dave, would not actually be all that useful, would it? So that is the light. Now let's take a look at the object. And the object is usually the most straightforward thing to understand. It's the thing that we focus on most in elementary school when we're learning about color. And that is that the entire visible spectrum is making it through that atmosphere and hitting that green grass. And only parts of that spectrum have the propensity to reflect off that grass. That is to say, the grass has the propensity to absorb most of that light and only bounces back and scatters the light that we associate with the green part of the spectrum. And so that spectrum, that part of the spectrum reaches your eye and you can see it. And therefore, you can perceive that grass as green. So the object's reflectivity, the light that the object absorbs or reflects, has a big part to play. Those are both, I think, fairly intuitive. I think the next two are a little less intuitive, that the eye itself as an organ, as a sensory organ, plays a role, that the mind also plays a role. So let's take a look at the eye. What's interesting about the eye is that as a sensory organ, it is exposed to a continuous spectrum of light, but it only feeds out, it only feeds back to our brain individual, sorry, the, the overall effect of that spectrum. So I'm gonna give you a metaphor here. Dave, could you please play three notes and then a chord? Three notes, chord, individual notes. Thank you, Dave. And could you also play for us just a minor chord, thing that has a different overall effect? Same C chord, but this one's a minor. So what you hear there is that the human organ of hearing can distinguish both individual components of a chord and also the chord itself. You can hear all three notes and you also hear this sort of synergistic, harmonic, pleasant, or slightly depressive or slightly abrasive combinations of those notes. But the eye is not like that when it comes to sensing the visible spectrum, the continuous spectrum of light. The eye only feeds back to the rest of your brain the holistic response, which is the color. So we see a spectrum of light, but the eye only translates that as a color. You don't look at a blue sky and see this chart, you just see the color blue. So let's take an example here uh, that I just, I, I had this image of a flying pink cow and I had to find a use for it in this presentation. I think I found a great use for it. We're gonna take these two different neon signs and we're going to figure out what their spectral components were. What is the nature of the light itself that is causing our eye to perceive this as pink? Now, for the purpose of this argument, we're assuming that we're in person and looking directly at the neon light and not looking at an RGB value on a screen that is recreating that light later on. We're there at the bar, we're there at the venue, and we're seeing these two big signs. Here are two possible different spectrums that both lead to a pink light. Light one has a peak here around 460 to 480, and then a valley, and then another peak at five, uh, around 580, and then another peak around 660. Light two has a completely different spectrum. It's basically strong in emittance, everywhere that light one was weak and vice versa. So the peaks are valleys for the one and the valleys are the peaks for the other. Both of these could then be fed into the eye and when your eye sees those spectrums can respond the exact same way. So remember that color is the sensation, it's not a physical property. So it's not true to say that your eye wouldn't be able to see the difference between these two colors. They are the same color. The perception, the sensation is identical for these two different spectra. That is one of the sources of the complexity of light and color that come into play with a lot of the problems we have in color. 
And then lastly, the mind. So the light has hit the green grass, the green grass has reflected some, the eye responds to the entire spectrum, but then only puts out responses that are characteristic of the holistic combination of those spectrums. But then our mind has to interpret those. What I wanna do is I wanna leave this image up on the screen for a moment, I'll make sure to give proper attribution. This image is of a specific painting, Still Life with Lemons by uh, <clears throat> the gentleman whose name I will not butcher and is used in one of the most famous and one of the most important tomes of color science, uh, which has been recently taken over and updated by Roy Burns uh, from RIT. And this image shows how important the mind is in the construction of color, the perception or sensation of color. I'm gonna show this to you, and I want you to ask yourself, what is the color of the fruit in the front center? And now I'm gonna show you the same exact image, but with a different white balance with the sort of overall cast of light on this image removed. Next, I'm going to return to showing you just that center fruit, that lemon from the first image. And if the effect was as it is for most people, when I showed you that first image, the fruit seemed to be yellow, right? If, if you have a background in color retouching in Photoshop and Capture One, if you work with color on a data basis, you may have noticed that the color of the lemon was contaminated or off or a little wrong in white balance, but you still would have perceived it as being yellow with a little bit of contamination, where in fact, it was just straight up green. Now, there are various phenomenon, various effects of the mind and the construction of the perception of color that are both out of scope for this presentation and frankly, out of my personal level of, of gravitas and understanding of color science, but they all add up to various forms of context, proximity, and contrast that play tricks on your vision based around the fact that we did not develop the sensory organ of the eye and the mind behind it in order to make accurate measurement devices, we evolved that capacity to survive, to find food, to avoid predators, to find others of our tribe. And so our eyes are not accurate. They're not measurement systems. They're systems of survival, of practical value. Another example of this, if we look at this image and you train your eye very focused on patch B, it's very hard not to see patch B as being brighter than patch A. And uh, as you might imagine, A and B are identical. So what is happening here in this specific case is that if you see something in the real world that has the same amount of light or brightness or number of photons reaching your eye as something that is not in shadow, then the thing in shadow must have been brighter in the first place, right? So it was brighter in the first place, saw less light, the same amount of total light hit your eye. Your brain has evolved an understanding of this. And so it is forcing you to see B as brighter because in the real world, that would be a useful thing. If you can imagine our ancestors or probably more accurately, our ancestors of our ancestors of our animal ancestors, ancestors, the ones that saw those identically had less of an ability to, for example, notice a dark predator on a dark background. So our practical evolved vision is not a measurement device and the mind plays a role in the construction of that color. So in summary of my, uh, we, we forget the summary, we, we should say that because color is then therefore not a physical characteristic of an object, but a sensation created in the viewer of which the object is a part, how then do we go about making a mathematical construct that can reproduce color across different devices, can describe color in a way that is consistent across different people and different time and different places? Well, if you need to characterize a sensation, you have to basically observe that sensation in practice. And that is just exactly what we have done, or I say we, what individuals like Dave and his colleagues in the color science community have done for the last century or so. And in the 20s and 30s, the 1920s, the 1930s, uh, a group of color scientists observed individuals around literally a dozen old white guys looking at two different colors and 
turning dials on a machine until they thought those two colors matched. They observed the sensation of the viewer in order to then reverse engineer what was going on under the hood to see what was going on in the light object I my combination. Now, what those mathematical constructs are, what the answer to that question is, what did they observe, and how do we use that today is all above my pay grade. So we have brought in Dr. Weibel, who will continue this presentation now in talking about color not as a sensation of a human being, but as a thing that is being reproduced in math. Dave. Thanks, Doug. Um, good job. Uh, so now, the portion now with extra Dave. Um, uh, Right, so we're going to talk color measurement now, which, um, as Doug kind of just led us right into nicely, uh, color measurement starts and ends with one simple fact, right? We are trying to create a machine, an instrument that gives us a number, and that number relates to the way that people see the color that we just measured. Uh, it's really no more or less than that. Um, so there's a poll up right now, if you want. It's sort of interesting. I ask this at most of my tutorials. Um, have you ever personally measured it? That means you personally, not a technician. You did not tell someone to measure it. You held an instrument and you made a measurement. So let, let that go. Um, also, I see five people have full degrees in color science. So um, great. I look forward to those questions. Um, so <laughs> that's the truth. I do look forward to those questions. Um, so I'm going to start with just a, it's a little bit of a fun slide. And I just call this, you know, why is this hard? Um, so in the color measurement world, um, we sometimes have to do things that are not uh, not ideal. Uh, you see this researcher here in the top left, he's measuring the color of a leaf. Um, uh, we got to measure the color of an orange, some fruit, a uh, snake. I love holding, holding a gizmo up to a snake and measuring its color, it's fantastic. Um, also, things aren't always nicely shaped. In the lower left, you see this round, uh, this uh, cylindrical shape, and then the, the, the person measuring the side of the car there. Um, what we love in the color measurement world, if everything was just wonderful and uniform and flat, like you see in the lower right, um, and that's great. We can make the best measurements that way, but sometimes we've got to deal with the rest of this stuff. Um, and that's what makes it sometimes a little challenging. Um, so, okay. So, uh, who did that, Doug? Um, so uh, uh, Doug hinted a little at this. Uh, I'm going to do a little more graphically, but he had talked about the same components, um, uh, the color triangle, three sides to every color. So we're going to start at the top there. And uh, we see we have this object. We have a blue object. I'm going to shine some light on it. That light is going to reflect off, and it's going to go into your eye. And then it's going to go off and get processed, um, some in the retina, some in your visual cortex in the back of your brain here. And then out of that comes a color perception, you know, red. Ooh. Um, and then at the bottom, we see an instrument which does about the same sort of thing. Instruments, usually, they have light sources. They shine that light onto an object, the sample that you want to measure, and that light reflects off to a detector. That detector goes off and does some processing and comes up with some numeric color. And if uh, if people uh, historically have done their homework right, um, there's some correlation between that color perception and that numeric color. That's that's the whole idea of this. So. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I did say it's a triangle, and uh, that line across the top from the light source over to the eye, um, the instrument doesn't usually do that, so we have to do that in some other way. Um, we're going to talk more about that before we're done, but it's an important leg of that triangle. It's definitely not a color science V. So, uh, what do we do when we want to communicate a color? So here I have just a silly example. I get a brand new car. It's a fancy car. I don't know what it is, honestly. Um, Guy gets a brand new fancy car, he calls his friend, his friend says, what color is your car? He says, oh, it's red. And, uh, and here's the real color car we can see, and yet the, uh, the guy gets called on the phone, is imagining a very different color. So, um, so we'd like to help him out a little bit there. Uh, so right now, if I want to actually communicate the color by just this word, really the only thing I can do is drive the car over and show the guy. It's like, man, he can look and think, aha, now I actually know what the color is. Um, it's not this red that I had imagined. It's this uh, more deeper thing. Um, of course, if he's a real car guy, he's really only looking at the car anyway. Um, so what else could I do? Uh, I could get out a slide deck of, co of uh, colors, right? They got these at the paint store, or this is a Pantone deck maybe, and I could pick out a number 
And I could call the guy on the phone and say, hey, it's red number 3254. The guy pulls out the same deck. He goes to 3254. And we hope that these match a little bit better. Um, but now we've got, you know, is the guy viewing them under the same lighting? Is he, uh, does he have the same color vision? Doug talked a little about how some, you know, people might see things differently. Um, uh, so this is a little bit better, but we're still asking for each of these individuals to make some kind of a subjective judgment. Now, what we really want to do is we want to measure the color. So that's what we're doing now is measuring the color of the car. And then I communicate numbers to this guy. I say, oh, it's L star of 40, A star of 50, B star of 25. Um, we don't know what those are yet, LABs, but we are going to, uh, we are going to explore that a lot. Um, so there's a poll up there right now. Do you know the difference between LAB and RGB? There's a lot of yeses. I'm going to hold you to that um, later. Uh, so here's, here's now, yeah, so now we're at objective color. Uh, both of these guys should be thinking the same color uh, if they have some nice color managed devices around. All right, so let's get to uh, why we have three, LAB, RGB, all these things. There's always three. So why is there always three? Uh, so if we just take a bunch of example colors and scatter some colors on there, and I ask you to sort these colors, usually what people do is they first uh, will pull out all of the neutrals, the achromatic colors, those are off on your left. Um, and then the chromatic colors, we did that. Uh, okay. Um, the chromatic colors are on your right over here and uh, neutrals are on your left. And, uh, and those are colors, by the way, your teacher was wrong, right, white, black, and gray are colors. Uh, they're just achromatic colors. So we have the chromatic ones on the right, achromatic ones on the left. And then if I further try to sort these, what would I do? I would probably break up the reds and the blues in this case. So I didn't touch the neutrals this time, broke up and sorted out the reds and the blues. And then the last thing I can do is I can take each of these within these groups and order them. And now I'm going to get a scale uh, at the bottom. I took and ordered those neutrals. So I got a lightness scale there from black to white or value scale, different terminologies. Um, and then uh, at the top, I have ordered the reds and the blues in terms of less red to more red, less blue to more blue. We're gonna call that like a saturation or a chroma, something like that. Um, but we're still only at two so far. We got the saturation number and we've got this lightness number. And so the last thing we're gonna add is the hue, which is the third. So when we go around that hue circle, which are traditionally what we would call the color names, uh, but we, but in the, the science world, we don't usually use those in terms of color dimensions. So we would call that the hue. And so now I have three numbers that are going to yield a definitive color. The hue of the color, the saturation of the color, how much of it there is, and then the lightness of the color, how bright is that color. And I've shown um, if, you're, uh, if you have DT uh, software at home or in your office, you will recognize this color picker. There's others in other applications, but they all have the same idea where uh, I can choose uh, any of these colors within this. So we see, in this case, saturation and hue are incorporated in the circle you see. And then one of the sliders down below will bring in the lightness, the, uh, you know, the, the lightness of the, of the color. So now uh, we can do a little bit better. Uh, I can say uh, my friend here looking at his new car, he says it's red, but red can still mean this block of colors there. Uh, anything, I think most of us would call any of the colors inside of that wedge we've put on the color picker. Uh, any of us would, could reasonably call those uh, colors red. So we need a little bit more than that. And we're not advancing. Sorry about this, it's just a little interface. Um, okay, so now I've taken and drawn a, uh, a more like the whole color space. So we see now that, that we have dark colors at the bottom and light colors at the top. So the lightness scale is vertical here. Um, we have along that lightness scale, we have got the sort of pastels with less color and more saturated colors the further out we go. And then around that circle, we see the hues, the hues that we, that we uh, that we defined in that hue circle. And so uh, each of these dimensions has got lots of names. We call the hue, as I said, color names, uh, or, an, or just an H value uh, for chroma. There's chroma, there's saturation, there's C star. 
for lightness. We have lightness, brightness, value, also all of these. Now, to be fair, since there are degreed color scientists in the audience, we I do understand uh, there are differences between these. And for the purposes of today's discussion, we're going to just kind of lump together chroma and saturation and lightness and brightness and value, even though uh, at a very strict level, um, we can we can definitively uh, differentiate between these uh, terminology. But for today, we'll just talk about these uh, in general terms. Um, OK, so C lab and CIE LCH. And I put the best space there as the little byline for this slide. Um, maybe not the absolute best, but these are good spaces. And the reason they're good spaces is that they have been kind of carefully designed so that um, they that the, that the colors, uh, the numbers in the space correlate well with what we see. And mostly that is related to the color difference between two things. Because that and historically, color difference has been probably the most important application because um, if we go way back uh, to um, early development of uh, textiles, for example, uh, they were very, very good at making the colors uh, from uh, batch to batch the same color. So we know uh, it's, it's really outside of your experience to buy a piece of clothing and have uh, the front of a shirt not match the sleeve, for example, uh, because the textile people really have this color difference down. They understand how to do this. And, and one of the tools they would have would be a space like C-Lab or older spaces where they, they would uh, they would have a color difference uh, equation related to that. And, and they were able then to uh, take a measurement and understand how different people, a difference, uh, the difference that people would see between those two colors, right? Uh, similarly, in the automotive world, it's pretty much outside of your experience to go to the new car lot and see a door not match a quarter panel, right? Because they, they know how to get this right. They know that you would reject that immediately because our eyes are so sensitive when we put two colors right next to each other like that. And then the automotive world has this down too. So, so there's two different spaces here, this LAB and LCH. They're really the same underlying set of colors. It's just a mathematical way to get into them. C-Lab uses rectangular coordinates, so the sort of XY plot, if you remember your high school geometry, um, as I've shown here. So A star is sort of the X-axis, B star is the Y-axis, and that's how I would define that color, A1, B1. Uh, if I go to LCH, uh, it's the exact same color, it's the exact same space, but I define it by a hue angle rotating up from the, uh, from the uh, x-axis there and then the distance out to that is the c star the chroma but both of them define the same colors and they're, they're really interchangeable and there's applications for one versus the other but um, don't think that they're you know you can go back and forth easily it's not like one is better than the other one um, in general okay so this is just the sort of wrap up of c lab i've taken that same color space you saw before and overlay these axes so kind of in general we see plus A star is being red, minus A star is being kind of green, plus B star is yellow, minus B star is blue, uh, L star of zero is black, L star at the top 100 is, is, uh, is white. And now for the range of, the, of these, um, L star is, is usually between zero and 100. You have to play some games to see anything outside of that range. And, and in the digital world, A star and B star both operate on these ranges of minus 128 to plus 100. And this is just a digital convenience because you'll notice 128 minus 128 to plus 127 is 256 levels, 255 levels, and um, and that's for uh, that's for an 8-bit uh, representation. So in your TIFF file, your 8-bit TIFF file, I've got 8 bits designated to tell me what the A star is for that pixel, and that's just so. So this you can make a color. You have to work, but you can make a color outside of these ranges for the A star and B star. Um, but practically, you've got almost all the real colors in the world are going to lie inside of that. Um, and so it's not unreasonable to cut things off at that 128 number. Um, but just understand that it really is a numerical convenience. It's not a, uh, it's not a physical thing. OK, so let's actually take a measurement now, a pretend measurement. Uh, we've got a, um, an old map here in this case. And I put my instrument on there, and I take a measurement, and I get these C-Lab data. Uh, and I say I got an L star of 75, an A star of 8, B star of 35. So this is kind of the color I put on the screen there, sort of a, a medium tan, a light brown sort of thing. Now, what do I do with that data, right? I could just, you know, archive it, throw it in the, uh, throw it in a file, and understand that this map 
has uh, the color of this in this one place or something, right? So I could do that. Um, I may want to do a little bit more. Um, I may want to uh, try to maybe going to fix this map. Maybe it's got some marks in it I don't like. I want to overpaint it or something. Or I'm in a painting world. We call it in painting. So I might use that color to go and select the right inks or pigments to do that in painting or that that repair uh, the conservation of this of this um, document. Um, I might just use the color for historical research. Um, or there's more. There's any number of things I could uh, we we can all imagine depending on what the the goal of the researchers are. Right. So I can take this color and, and use it. And once I've got this now definitive color, I can do all kinds of good things with it. So one of the things I might want to do is make a color reproduction. And to do that, I'm going to take that tan color. I'm going to run it into some kind of materials database and then predict with some math. I'm going to predict what combination of inks can I put onto a piece of paper? Say I got my inkjet printer, right? What combination of, of uh, pigments could I put down on that and yield the right color, the same color? So I've done that, and I've done maybe some kind of job here. So I measure then this reproduction, and I got an L star of 74, A star of 3, B star of 32. So it's a little different than what I started with. And the question is, is the match good? And I say, I don't know. It kind of depends on what your needs are, right? Um, back to that automotive example, um, this would not be good enough for the automotive example. It would be not be good enough for your clothing. You would complain about this and, and take it back. Um, for some applications, this is going to be more than fine. Maybe for house paint or something. I don't know. Um, it would be fine. Uh, but the question is, is that match good is, is, a, is an application difference, is an application question. But how would we actually tell the difference? And that is... Um, a big field in the color science world called color difference. Um, uh, so again, I, I guess I said most of this already. Uh, is it good enough? And it's, it depends, right? It depends on what it is you have. Uh, so let's go on to, oh, on to instrument geometries. OK, so we're kind of done with, with uh, color for now. And we're going to move into the actual instrument world. Um, a little byline for this slide says, make sure you are asking the same question. That's always good. So instruments come in a variety of what we call geometries. And this is just different ways. If we go back to that color triangle, this is different ways of shining the light on a sample and different ways of detecting the light that reflects off the sample. Um, most of you out there probably use a bi-directional instrument, bi-directional, two directions. And that would be one set of light that is incident. And in this case, it's going to be at 45 degrees. So that's the light between kind of drawn where the light bulb is down below and then the, 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 uh, the angle between the blue and the red cones, that's at 45 degrees, incident on the sample down below. And then uh, I said 45 zero, so the zero indicates that the detection is that green cone going uh, straight overhead, zero degrees, normal to the sample, normal angle. Um, and, and if I take a measurement of the same sample, but with an instrument that has different geometries, a different geometry, I may get a different LAB out at the end. And that's not because the instruments are broken. It's because you are asking a different question. I told you in the beginning, ask the same question. Uh, make sure you're asking the same question. And this is no different than me measuring something with, inch, with an inch ruler and you saying, uh, I told you it was five, and then you measured it in centimeters, and it's not five anymore. And you complain. Well, you're, you're, you know, it's because you asked a different question than I, than I answered for you. So the lesson down at the bottom, measurements should always be accompanied by metadata. In general, that's always true of measurements. In this case, we want to include the geometry of the instrument. And even better, we'd like to include the make and model of the instrument, because these can vary slightly from model to model even. Right. So now where, so we have that instrument made and that instrument can give us, what that instrument gives us though is not LAB data, but spectral data. And we're going to get a little more to that in a, in a bit. But I want to talk just a moment about these different sort of uh, LA, uh, RGB kind of spaces. Um, what you see on the right are three different sets of curves. So for each of these, we're looking at a uh, wavelength range of the visible range, 400 to 700 nanometers, 400 at the left, 700 on your right. And then we see three sets of curves. Again, there's three, no coincidence, there's three, back to the whole three thing. Uh, the top ones are uh, LMS values, which stands for long, medium, and short wavelength cones, our cones in our eyes. These are the sensitivities 
of uh, this is this is how the physical chemistry and cones in our eyes work when they, we hit them with certain wavelengths of light. Um, the middle one is actually a similar plot to what Doug showed when he was showing us that visual experiment where there were the RGB lights on one side and a single light on the other, and he told us how the scientists twiddled the knobs until the two matched, and out come these curves. That's what these curves are, a similar experiment. And the bottom ones are the ones we're actually going to use in our color measurement uh, procedure here, and these are the CIE 1931 2-degree XYZ color matching functions. So the biggest thing I want you to take away from is you may come across these color matching functions in your in your world out there at some point, but don't think that those are what your eye, how your eye sees colors. They're certainly all related to how your eye see colors, but these are designed to um, produce this numerical color that we get at the end of the line. Um, they don't necessarily tell us, and you can see just the difference between the top and the bottom plots. So these are not really the same sets of curves. Now on the left, we see all this scary math of how we would calculate uh, LAB values. Uh, they're based on these XYZ values. Um, color scientists apparently don't have a lot of imagination when it comes to the names of variables. So we have XYZ values, we have LAB values. Um, and we're going to get into in the next slide where these actually come from. We're going to start with the physical reflectance data, which is the spectral data, how much the light reflects off. Doug showed you that uh, uh, green uh, light. So we had the rainbow light coming down out of the sky and then the green light reflecting over at the person. So we're interested in that reflection property there. Come on. There we go. Okay. Oh, one too many. So what I want you to look at is we're going to watch in the top in the upper right. There's a rectangle there. So as we go through the next through few slides, we're going to paint up a color triangle right there. And in the middle, we've got again some more spectral plots, 400 to 700 nanometers, blue to red, roughly. Um, and we're going to go through and see how the math works, just like the color triangle. So the math we're seeing here, we have X at the top. There's a summation sign. R is reflectance. S is the light source and X bar is how that human being sees the color. So the first thing we're going to do is put down a sample. So there's my cyan sample, and this is the physical reflectance of a cyan sample that I've shown in the curves here. So it gives us a fair amount of the sort of blue-green color, very little up in the red. It's cyan, and I've blocked off in the scary math the reflectance. So that's what we're talking about now is reflectance. Now I'm going to bring in the source. So in my color triangle, I put the light source up there and it's shining down onto the sample. As I've indicated in the left, the, uh, the rectangle shows us that we're now talking about the source. Each of these are a function of wavelength. That's what the lambda is. The curve in the middle is about the, that of, a, uh, of an incandescent light, um, the nice warm light that's shining on Doug's face right now, unlike what I have. Voila. And then mathematically, uh, the, the product and I see now R times S in the scary math, and that, that, that is a uh, multiplication. And then when I multiply these two curves, I get these uh, the red area that you see down there. And then that is an indication of the light that has reflected off the sample. And we see now I've added that arrow in the top right, and it's now light shining off toward the eye. Now I'm going to bring in the eye itself, and here are these three curves, the X, Y, Z, uh, color matching functions indicated in the scary math. And now when I do the, again another multiplication of all three of those curves together and I get these three leftover curves that you see, red, green, and blue, which are X, Y, and Z. And then when I do the summation, I actually just add up all those values that are left and then sum them up and out comes the X tristimulus value, the Y tristimulus value, and the Z tristimulus value. So there's the end of scary math, not really so bad, but we're not quite done with the story yet because the person has to see the color, right? So the X, Y, Z is representative of the signal that gets back to the brain, the heads back toward the brain, but the brain still does a little bit more work and we see now that I've uh, done some thinking and I see the brain perceives cyan just like the cyan we measured, so the system uh, it's hopefully working here. Now, in the beginning, I promised we'd talk about that other arrow, the red arrow I just added there. 
uh, and we haven't yet, and that is going to be important. So we'll see now in the next slide. The um, I remember a few slides ago I showed you that LAB, you know, the other scary math, and each one of those, so I had the Y tristimulus value, for example, in L star, but it's divided by that YN. That YN is this normalizing factor that accounts for the light source. So that's what that other arrow is going from the sun and this get the light source over to the brain is that's this adaptation that we that takes place kind of automatically in our brains we automatically adapt to the the white point in a room or in the scene and that changes how we perceive the color by whether we think we're looking at a color uh, in under say a white light or a red light or a blue light that's going to that that our, our brains automatically account for that you don't think that the paper changes color because I go from an incandescent yellowish light to a white or bluish white fluorescent light. Our perception is never that the paper changed color. We still say it's white. And that's because of these denominating fact, denomination factors here that, uh, that divide out the, uh, the effect of that. So um, for a variety of light sources, each light source is going to have its own X, N, Y, and Z, N normalizing factors. And I put a few of these down below. Uh, F2 is sort of cheap fluorescent, like you might see in a, in a Walmart or Target. Um, D50 is daylight. That's probably the one most of you are going to use when you do this. Your software is probably already using this, but you really ought to know. Um, a is uh, Lumen A is that uh, tungsten light that we showed a few minutes ago in the slide. And LED is just a, a you know modern white LED, and we see these numbers all vary some, and so we would expect the color the, the color prediction that comes out of those is going to be different. Okay, uh, the last thing I didn't say, but the metadata back on this slide. Uh, so metadata now that should accompany the measurement and the LAB values is what is the uh, the illuminance? Is it F2? Is it D50? Is it A? And we didn't talk too much about the standard observer, but you want to record that too. We're always using the 1931 um, two degree observer here. So now how can this actually impact your life? So I, I took and uh, uh, construed a couple of colors here. So uh, in the, the plot there, you'll see uh, a straight line at about 22.22. Uh, That's a sort of mid gray. And uh, we're saying that that reflects exactly 0.22 amount of the light at all wavelengths across the visible spectrum. That's a neutral gray. And then I invented this other color that's the dash line. And it, uh, it varies a lot. You see it's a little squiggly. Um, but I pretty carefully selected that color. This is all just done in math, by the way. But, it, but we could do a real one if we wanted. Um, so I pretty carefully selected that so that when I, when I run that through the math, for D50 luminant with those X and Y and Z ends, I get these two colors that match exactly. Those should be the same on your screen, they're the same RGB, so those should match perfectly. But if I take and illuminate these same two colors with F2, with that cheap fluorescent, I get this, this two different colors. So not only has the color changed from a gray to a light brown, but the colors that used to match no longer match. And if I illuminate it with tungsten light, luminant A, uh, we go a step even further. It's like, it seems like it's a worse match and it's farther different, more different from the gray. And kind of by coincidence, if I hit this with the uh, with an LED, uh, it turns out that this LED must look about like the D50 because those colors are, are close. It's still a little bit of a, a mismatch. But So this is why you want to record uh, the uh, the illuminant all the time with uh, what it is. Uh, yes, Doug. Dave, I just want to make the same point that we made when we were talking about the two pink signs, and that is it's not accurate to see that your eye is unable to see the difference in color under one of those illuminants. It's that under that illuminant, it is the same color, and under a different illuminate, it is a different color. So it's not a hidden inability for us to discriminate. It is that color is the sensation, and so under the first conditions, the sensation is identical. Right, right. Good, thank you. All right, so we're going to move to sort of instrumentation world and get through some of this stuff um, pretty quick here. Um, so sometimes you have a need for uh, multiple, uh, say, facilities around the world. Maybe you make some widget and you, uh, and some widget has a color and it has uh, some tolerance around that color. But you want to make sure that, for example, your facility in Brazil or in Africa, when they reject a widget, or when they pass a widget, we always want to make sure that they're rejecting the same color widgets uh, correctly like they are in all the other facilities around the world. We can't have um, 
some that fail some places and pass other places that are actually the same color and getting to customers. We don't want that to happen. So what we really want to do is we want our instruments to all measure the same. A good place to start with that is to buy the same instrument model, make and everything, and then ship them out to your different facilities. And that's going to give you the best chance of making sure that what I just described did not happen. Your instruments are going to behave the same, measure the same. Um, more likely, uh, you aren't able to do that. So you have different instruments. They're all drawn the same here. But let's imagine some of these are different models. So what you would do in this case is you would have one of these be kind of the gold standard. And then you would do some math to make sure that all the other ones actually measure the same. So this is actually not a whole lot different than what you may do when you, uh, many of you probably on the line here have characterized a camera. And what do you do when you do characterize a camera? You put a known target in front of a camera and that target comes with measurements and you take an image of that and then out comes some data that are not gonna correlate with those measurements. They're gonna be RGBs for one thing, they're not gonna be CLAP data. And then some math correlates those two. And this is really not much different than that. I would take some known, uh, uh, probably ceramic tiles that came with measured data and I would measure them at home at the gold standard and I would measure them at each of these facilities around the world. And then I would do some math and make sure that they all work the same. So that again, from a, from a uh, industrial sort of tolerance and quality control point of view, uh, stuff that passes in one place, passes in the other place, what fails in one place, fails every place. So we have the, we're shipping this, a consistent product to our customers. Another thing you want to do is uh, even out in the field, you want to make sure that your instrument is stable over time. So what we typically do there would be choose a few uh, stable samples, something that's not going to change over time, like a uh, ceramic tile is another good choice. And then I pull them out every week or every month or whatever your quality control process uh, deems. And I measure those and then I plot up the C-Lab data on uh, some kind of a control chart, time chart there. And as long as I stay within the two tolerances, I'm happy. Um, how to draw those tolerances is really going to be up to you. As I said, in the automotive world, where we got those two colors right next to each other, these tolerance lines are going to be really close together. And what that turns into is money, right? It means that when your instrument varies just a little bit, you probably got to pay to have it fixed. Whereas if we're in a situation where we have wider tolerances, then our instrument can, can kind of float around a little more and we're still okay with that because our tolerances are different. Um, but bigger tolerances are less expensive, smaller tolerances are gonna be more expensive. So similarly to uh, keeping track of your instrument over time, um, it's always good to let the professionals handle it. So uh, most instrument manufacturers like to see your instrument back once a year. Um, I have yet to figure out what happens to an instrument magically when you've circumnavigated the sun that one time, but um, it's a good figure anyway. Um, and that can get expensive. You might pay two or three, four hundred dollars more for a benchtop instrument, maybe seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars for a benchtop instrument. It sounds expensive to your boss and it is expensive. But I, what I would say to this is when you buy a car, you know, you're going to have to change the oil and buy new tires and, and perform maintenance. And this is no different than that. If you just let your car go for 10 years without touching it, your car, car only made it for three years and it would die. Uh, and you don't really want to have an instrument that's all of a sudden been 10 years old and has never been back to the factory. They're probably not even going to service it at that point. And now you buy a new instrument. Um, so, uh, so I'd say at the bottom there, ask yourself the cost of not keeping your instrument in service. That's really uh, the, the important thing here. So another one just about making measurements. We want to make, try to make it as consistent as we can. This is one example of how to do that. And that would be if your samples are not fully opaque, like a lot of papers are not fully opaque, you want to make sure that you back them with the same thing. It's not whatever workbench you happen to be on or whatever desk you happen to be on. You want to make a deliberate decision to put maybe black or white or whatever it is behind it and always do the same thing. So my example here, I have kind of an orangey color. And in one case, I measured it on a white background and another I measured it on a black background. And these are very different colors. We didn't talk too much about the color difference, the, the sort of magnitude of color differences, but this, this color difference is, is 3.4. This Delta E is 3.4, um, which I pretty, pretty much can guarantee that most of us in the room would be able to tell the difference between these colors. So um, if that's important, then you know if this is a color critical situation, just the fact that I measured it on white versus black, I may have done all the rest of my work correctly, but 
I measure it on white versus black when I should it on a black versus white and uh, and I get a different number out. So maybe now I fail, reject some product, you know. So so be consistent. Um, and this is, this is across the board at being consistent, right? Um, I want to uh, always do things like keep my reference standards clean. Every one of these instruments you buy is going to come with a white tile to calibrate it on. And you want to make sure that stays clean. If that gets dirty, your data is going to be bad. Um, maintain uh, room temperature and, uh, and humidity, potentially. Colors can change over temperature, believe it or not, sometimes enough to notice. And certainly in a tight quality control situation, definitely enough to notice. So you might want to re be recording those, uh, the lab ambient. I do that in every certificate that I ship to uh, when I make high accuracy measurements for my customers. Uh, every one of those certificates has a humidity temperature on it. Um, your operators, we've talked about you know, like the white and the black stuff, but more than that, we want to make sure they're all trained to apply consistent procedures. Whatever one is doing uh, throughout the course of the day, how often you calibrate your instrument, where you, how you store things, how you clean up the samples before you measure them, all these things need to be done the same way and consistently to get the right kind of data uh, from your uh, free measurements. And then, as I said a couple times, record all the metadata. Um, Whatever is important in the in, is going on should be there in that notebook, in that file, and associated with that data. So I put a couple resources here. Uh, there's a few instrument manufacturers on the top. These are not uh, by any means all of them in the world. These are a few that I'm familiar with. Um, they all have presences uh, in the U.S. and internationally, more than likely in the country you're in right now. Uh, a couple of online uh, places, uh, the Wikipedia page, colorimetry tends to be pretty good. I keep an eye on that. Um, make sure that wackos don't go in and change things. Um, and then the uh, RIT Munsell Color Science Laboratory, where I have a long history of uh, there. Uh, we've got a page together at this that uh, just a variety of things that you might find interesting, some sample reflectance files, some uh, some uh, MATLAB, some Excel files, uh, things like that. So um, go peruse around there and uh, and see what you find. Um, so that is, I think, it for me. Doug's going to take over now and tell you a little bit about digital transitions. Maybe new to TT. I'd be reticent if I didn't mention that our neural day-to-day -day work is not in abstract color science. It is in the applied color science. That is, we make on one side of our business systems that digitize historical collections at museums, libraries, and archives, and the occasional individual photographer uh, scanning film, books, artwork, objects, ephemera. Uh, and we also have a service bureau that does that same work using our equipment. And on the commercial individual side of our business, we have uh, some of the highest quality cameras, uh, both in terms of color science and in terms of resolution and sharpness and features and workflow. So. Pardon the 30 seconds ad here towards the end, uh, but we did want to give you some sense for what we normally do outside of education and outside of outreach. So back to our sort of regularly scheduled programming, as you might say, we want to stop now. And this is the end of the presentation. We have, uh, I think, Dave, as long as you have time, I think we have at least 12 minutes of time during which we can answer some questions. And I know some questions have already been asked. For those uh, in the chat area, Please feel free to post your questions. They are being read and they are being flagged. Uh, we just reserved them for this section. So Arnab, if we could have, please, the first question flagged. I'll read the question for you, Dave. How different do L, A, and B levels need to be for most folks to differentiate similar colors? So a use case example here is that we have uh, objective level targets, something like an ISA golden thread target or the DTNGTT target, uh, the NGT to target, and we have values we expect them to be in lab, and they will never be exactly to the last decimal point, exactly those levels. So how far do they need to be off before it matters? Before people can just differentiate. So, well, it's kind of a loaded question. It, it, the usual number would be uh, about one unit, um, but that's a very heavily dependent number on where, where I really am. Like, for example, if I am way out in a super chromatic yellow or orange, I might be able to change my B star or L star by two or three or four units before I can notice it. Whereas if I'm down around very achromatic pastels, I could go from an A star of plus one to an A star of minus one, and that's going to have the effect of going from a light 
pastel pink to a light pastel green, and we're all going to completely freak out at those two units. So it really depends on where I am in color space, but the sort of generic number is in the kind of one to two range, most people are probably going to see a difference uh, as long as we're not super chromatic colors. Dave, can I add uh, one topic to that, and that is that if the two colors in question or the two different readings in question are on a hard edge along a long line, you'll be able to see that much more readily and much more quickly than if they're, for example, in two isolated circles away from each other. So, for example, when comparing two physical prints of two different reproductions, if you are holding one section up directly up against the other, you will be able to see smaller and be able to differentiate more cleanly smaller differences as opposed to just having one up on a wall on the left and one up on a wall on the right. Yep, definitely. Right back to what I was saying about the, uh, like in the automotive application, when you got the door panel right next to the front quarter panel and you got direct abutment, your eyes are very, very sensitive to that. Um, and so that's, that's going to be, those are going to be even smaller numbers than I was talking about. And the other thing in terms of the memory, uh, especially memory over time, um, we're we're just we're pathetically bad at it. We think we're way better at it than we are, um, and so that's why we all when we're doing critical color difference, we always do exactly what you just said, Doug, and that is we put the two colors directly next to each other. That's going to maximize our perceived difference between the two. You're not even talking about memory. Like I remember the green grass when I was growing up. You were, you mean like literally look, put it away, look again, already gone. Yep, 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 and that happens fast. Ten minutes is almost as bad as twenty four hours. Wow. Okay. Uh, Arnab, if you could flag another question. What is the difference between metamerism and metameric failure? So this oh. is a great question to throw at Dave because I will tell you I have been publicly chastised on two separate occasions for making what I as a baby color scientist, as a practitioner, would consider to be fairly minor confusions between exact terminology and situations of metamerism and metameric failure. To assist you, Dave, I'm going to bring up the slide where we had your two different grays. Well, yeah, okay. Maybe someone could tell me what they really mean. Gregory, uh, give me an example of what you're calling by metameric failure, right? So metamerism in general, if we go back to like, you don't have to go all the way back, Doug, but Doug's slide way back when he was showing the three lights on one side and one light on the other side, um, that was an example right there of that that match right there is is a metameric match because uh, in this case like if i put this gray on uh, if i put in the left the lower uh light if i put a gray there a neutral gray like i was saying before spectrally flat these three rgb lights cannot hope to make a spectrally flat sh specular spectral shape they're going to make a bumpy shape but yet I perceive that just like the same, the example I gave, that was when you wanted to go to Doug, it's probably better, yeah. Um, the example I gave too, I had that spectrally flat shape and then I had this bumpy shape. And the fact that those can both be perceived as the same color is what we would call as metamerism, right? Now, so I haven't seen, uh, I don't see uh, Gregory chiming in on what in particular metameric failure means to him. Um, I'm not exactly sure what what we what we could say there. We could maybe maybe that would be a, a question of, I mean, anytime you change something, uh, if you change the observer, if you change the light source, uh, you could potentially get a new color out, and that would that that would be so we could have observer metamerism, and that might be one form of metameric failure where I made a match. And my boss came in who's about to ship this product and the boss looks and says that's not a match well that's an observer metamerism failure it could be that i looked under a different light source i could have two samples that match under d50 we'll say and then i send them off to my customer and they're sitting in their car in the parking lot in the sunlight and they don't match anymore so that's an example of an illuminant metamerism where i changed this and I ended up with a, a mismatch. So I'm sorry if that doesn't answer what metameric failure is to you, Gregory. But uh, um, let it. You know, if we got time, uh, put in a comment here, and we'll uh, we'll see if we can address it. So what's next? Yeah. And, um, so are ceramic sorry. tiles stable reference targets or not? So you mentioned that a lot of devices will arrive with a white ceramic tile and make sure to keep that clean. 
Uh, can you address the question of stable reference in general? So what what are typically they are, they, they, are they are extremely stable uh, if you buy the right tiles. Um, I guess the question maybe is related to I said that the color changes with temperature. Um, and I'm not really calling that instability because if I go back to the same temperature, they're always going to be the same color. I mean, there's a, there's a famous experiment done in the color science world where um, some gentlemen took a set of uh, 12 ceramic tiles. They measured them, I don't know, every six months or a year for 25 years and finally published the results. And, and the, uh, the data differed by less than the uncertainty of the instrument. So um, these things are very, very stable. Um, and, and I don't know if I implied somehow that they weren't other than temperature wise, then I, I apologize. I made a, I, I made a, a miss, miss speaking there. So, Excellent. okay, what's next? So while Arnab pulls up the question that is next, I'll just remind everybody that you are still welcome to enter new questions into the chat dialogue. Uh, once we have hit sort of our current maximum, we will probably only be able to answer the Question Sorry, Doug, uh, I, I'm going to need to refresh my browser uh, since this pop-up isn't working. Yep. So I will flag one up. And my flagging question will be in Imatest. This is for you, Dave. Yeah. Which EAB002000 or EAB, so I assume that's Delta E2000 or Delta E1931, or am I misconfusing and, and conflating terms here? Yeah, this is, this is a little bit. I assume uh, they mean Delta E. And not quite a. Yeah, yeah, we have delta E. What this really should say is delta E two thousand or delta E A B, because the the A the E A B O O in the first part is is that's those are conflicting. There, it's either one or the other, um, which is an Imatest. Which uh, I don't know what I mean. Imatest is a very full featured product, and I'm going to guess that you could choose any delta E you want to use, which is used by most organizations. Um, uh, kind of, again, another loaded question. We would like you to use Delta E2000. It's definitely the, the best color difference equation out there, but the problem is that it's very complicated uh, to use. So if you're actually implementing it, it's tough. If you have just a pull down in your software that says which to choose, choose Delta E2000, it's gonna give you the best results. So but I, would, right, yeah, I would love to expand on that question just a little bit here by pointing out I just need to get the right slide up for it. Let me get into this lab space here. So Dave presented on the lab color space and representing color in this way and mentioned that the purpose of lab and one of the foundational elements of its construction mathematically is to try to keep equal distance, meaning equal perceptual change. And that is something that has been redone, revamped, revised over time several times. Dave, please jump in at any point where I make a mistake. And the first iterations of that were in the 20s and 30s. There was iterations of that in the 70s, another iteration of that in the 2000. And so each of those numbers, you know, when you say Delta E 1976 or Delta E 2000, you're referring to using the math that has been refined and released and collaborated in the international community to that specific point in time. And so in general, using the more recent one is using the most recent consensus of scientists in the color space in the color science community as to what is the best math to use. Generally, the, the, the more recent, the better in that context. Right. Well, one of the reasons folks use the older stuff is because they're, they're referencing older information and older databases. Like for example, a paint company may be maintaining databases for who knows how long, 10, 20, 30 years, uh, their pigment databases, and they may want to use older uh, older calculations in order to align with the older math that they would have done. That makes sense. That the, same reason why the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is still used by some people, even though it's a really terrible metric, but it's the only metric that's still been the exact yeah. same metric for that two period of time. Right. Terrible metric, but it's better than all the others. Okay. Uh, next question up will be, what differences are happening between making device color correction profiles from spectral versus lab measurements. So uh, the context of the question is that you can generate device profiles, things like camera profiles or printer profiles using either full spectral data or a lab measurement. And 
Can you address for us some of the practicalities of achieving both of those kinds of device profiles and what the differences might be in their ramifications? Oh, geez. So I presented a, uh, an hour about how to crawl and maybe to walk, and now the questions are about how to teleport. Um, so so uh, what differences are happening between making device and device? Okay, so, so definitely device profiling and things is, is a little bit on the edge of my expertise, I would say. Um, ultimately, we want to get everything spectral. And the reason is that spectral is more of a fundamental property of a material. When I say, when you say, what is the LAB of this of this uh, paint or something, um, that LAB has what we are, what we talked about for the last hour. It has an illuminant built into it, and it has this, an observer, a person built into it. Um, and those are not bad things. We want to know those things when we're talking about the color. But if I'm talking about a material property, back to that map I measured, right? I may really not want the this, the color of that map. I want to know the material properties, the spectral data. I can always calculate the color later on. But if I'm going to record one thing, I would want to record the spectra of that. So if you've got ways to come up with a spectral device profile where at the end of the line, your rendered TIFF file is, I don't know how many planes, say so 31 planes, 400 to 700 nanometers, right? It's a big file, but that's going to be much closer to the material properties that you started with in your original uh, painting or artwork or uh, artifact, whatever you imaged, versus those C-Lab data. Once you go to C-Lab, there's no going back, right? I can't uncalculate C-Lab and get to the spectra data, usually. Well, I'll cut you off there so we can answer other questions and just reference the fact that the area of science we'd be talking about now or the area of imaging would be multispectral or spectral imaging. We, in fact, recently released a product for that uh, in conjunction with phase one. And in general, it seems obvious that in the long-term future, 10, 50, 100 years from now, more imaging and more image science and more image profiling will be done with spectral. But there are significant hindrances to, for example, going outside and calibrating your iPhone using the specific spectral information of the world outside and the world of the camera. So right now we are typically still shooting a chart. Uh, Arnab, if you're there, maybe you could throw up the DTNGT2 target that Dave and DT worked on and shooting a target like that and running it through uh, device profiling would be the most common approach today by far. Nice. So what metrics this is a great question for Dave. And, and Dave, you, you failed to use one of my favorite words that you introduced into my lexicon, metrologist. You are an experienced, trained, and expert measurer dude. So you are a metrologist. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, that is that is what I what I am, and uh, and uh, and it can be very frustrating sometimes with some people. So um, as a metrologist, metrologist, what metrics would you well, look for yeah, in considering well, a new spectrophotometer? A new spectrophotometer, right? So I mean, there's a bunch of things you're interested in, right? One of them may be: Do you want it to be portable, or do you want it to not be portable? Right, if you've got a clean, nice benchtop area that you're going to use and you can bring all your samples into the lab, um, you're going to spend a little bit more money, but you're probably going to get better measurements overall with a benchtop instrument in the lab. Um, another thing to consider, so that's, that's sort of portability, right? Uh, that's one thing to consider. Um, you can, if you really are only interested in color, you can save some money by buying an instrument that only gives you color. It's going to give you uh, you know, you may be able to uh, to choose, do I want D50 color, D, D, D50 C-Lab, D65 C-Lab, Illuminant A C-Lab. You may get those sort of choices, but you might not get the, the spectral data out. Um, and you can save a little money with that one. And that would be, um, that would be called a colorimeter. Col uh, sorry, a colorimeter. Right? That or would be a color. Word right? down for the pronunciation, just color meter, right? A col yes, color exactly. Right. Right. Uh, another thing you're interested in is uh, how large is the sample port? If you are doing device camera device profiling, often or printer profiling, they sometimes want to print a sheet of really with the thousands of little colors on it and measure them all with these devices. You might need a device that measures only a three millimeter, three millimeter spot size. Um, if you can measure larger, you're probably going to get more consistent measurements. But there are some issues that happen when you start getting smaller and smaller sample sizes. So, but sometimes you need it. If you're in the printing world, you're going to need it. Um, so that's be the sample size. The geometry is something to consider. I talked about bidirectional data uh, versus um, uh, hemispherical data. That one is largely going to be driven by your industry. If you're in printing or most of the folks in the archiving world 
are using a bi-directional spectrophotometer. And you'll want to use that only to be consistent with the rest of the people in your field. Um, there are certain fields out there in the paint industry, uh, for example, they use the hemispherical. That's a different different optical geometry. The light shining on the sample and is, is in a different way than the lights detected in a different way. Um, but that's what the paint industry has always used. So all the paint stores do that and they're all consistent with each other and so they can talk the same language. Um, and then and, uh, finally, I mean, I kind of just hinted at this, but um, you really want to look into your field and see what it is your field uses for spectrophotometers and make sure that you're going to be consistent with that. Um, you know, it doesn't mean buying exactly the same model and make and all that, but uh, it, it's important that when you're communicating with your either customers or vendors, if you do such things, um, that you're talking the same language. Mm -hmm. uh, to that extent, I would say that in the museum and library and archive space in the United States, which is the specific segmentation that I have personal experience with and, and experience through DT with, the I1 spectrophotometer is widely used. I could not speak nearly as deeply as uh, Dave could as to whether or not it is the most technically prowess device for that. But I can say there's a very large advantage to using the exact same device as a large number of other people in your same community and group of, of uh, collaborative entities. And so if you don't have a compelling reason to do something else, I think an I1 spectrophotometer is a very good choice. I agree. OK, um, so we have finished that one. Can, is there a standard for recording metadata from color measurements? So we will go to your slide, uh, Dave, where you were talking about the fact that you should yeah. indicate information about how the measurement was made. Um, which is just generally good science in general, right? To include more information. Actually, Dave, would you mind finding this slide? I don't remember where it is. But you were referencing uh, the fact that it, 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 I don't think we have to go there. Um, it was okay. it's the second one from the second or third one from the end. Um, one thing I will say, I don't I don't have the answer to that question, but what I do know is that on May 11th, the Imaging Science and Technology uh, Archiving Conference will have a two-hour short course called Scientific Imaging and Metadata Management with the Digital Lab Notebook. Um, okay. Hopefully that's not some competitor of, uh, of DJ. Sure. <laughs> okay, so that, that's all I really know. I, I don't know the answer to that other than that. I mean, I, I don't get in that far into the industrial practice. So that's information, science, and technology, IS and yes, imaging.org. And I believe that imaging.org, that conference will be available remotely given the current COVID crisis. Yes, it will, all 100% remote. So hey, um, that is a fantastic answer. It's going to be great. Um, I don't Dean. know what this question means. Me neither. Okay. But someone someone commented, ooh, that's a great question. So maybe they, uh, I, I asked for some clarification. Um, Andrew, or uh, I apologize, Matthews, I, I, if I'm mispronouncing your name, if you could clarify. Um, my my thought was, you know, are they talking about? Um, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So they're talking about the effect of sensor gain or ISO on color constancy and accuracy of color registration. Yeah, yeah that's that's. I don't know. I don't ISO. Know. That's my pay grade. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Our experience is that with high quality modern cameras, the ones that we tend to sell today are phase one cameras. Uh, those cameras at low ISO or at medium ISO have so little noise, even in darker patches of reflected material, that they are unlikely to negatively or deleteriously affect, for example, delta E measurements that would be measured for FADG or ISO compliance. But our knobs shortening is pretty good shorthand using the lowest ISO that you can otherwise practically achieve for your imaging is always a good idea. Uh, otherwise, practical does have exceptions. There are times where you have to go up. And I would recommend for you the Digitization 101 class in the DT website. That's dtcultureheritage.com. Uh, or not, maybe you could throw up a Digitization 101 link uh, in the interface. But that addresses the question of ISO and quality what, or camera gain. Okay, let's answer, uh, if we have time, Dave, uh, maybe say three more questions and then we will have to call it today. Yeah. So here's a great one. Is there a variability 
in the eye's sensory response to numerical wavelength values, not just the sensation of colors. So coming back to the full visible spectrum slide, can you speak to your, your, uh, your RGB mixing slide? At the end of my presentation, right? Yeah. Well, I think, well, I assume we're not talking about uh, variability person to person. So I think, I, 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 no, I'm sorry. I think, uh, Dave, I, I think that is the nature of the question. That's how I interpret Rob's question. Person, person to person? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm trying to make this, this, there's some thing in my way here uh, that I can't make move. Um, anyway, I don't know the interface. So the variability, eyes, sensory response to numerical. Okay. So this is person to person then. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, there are, we've, we all know of um, well, what we always used to call color blind people, um, the uh, color deficient people. And these are folks that, uh, and there's a couple different ways that could be. Uh, those, those their, uh, their cones might detect light a little bit less strongly than some. They might detect slightly different wavelengths. So these bumps would be moved one side to another. Uh, from person to person. I mean, they are, there's this huge variation out there. Um, but believe it or not, this data that uh, Doug described or captured in the late 1920s um, has really held up, even though the number of people was relatively small. There's been zillions of studies across continents and cultures and, and uh, different races, different uh, ethnic backgrounds, and they all come back to pretty much that this is a pretty good way to do it and measures color pretty well. Um, so, so do so. What I would say is that, and, and there's even a case where the answer to your question might be yes. There's variability, but the sensation of the colors doesn't really change much. So, and would we, we really would we really know, Dave? The no, not from a sensation point of view. This is the whole psychological thing of right. do I see red? Do I see red? Or is it just because my mom told me it was red? You know that right. sort of thing. So you're right. Um, the only thing we can do is infer the way that they're seeing the colors is the same by some other experimentation and things. So, so by observational uh, experimentation in general, the variability from person to person is surprisingly low other than those people who have a specific genetic physical abnormality that prevents yeah. them from seeing certain colors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the thing, if you're really interested in the thing to look into, the CIE in 2006 uh, published some data on how to tweak those color, those X, Y, Z color matching functions in a way that would correlate with um, how old the person was and what the field size you're looking at is two degree versus 10 degree versus 20 degree field size. Um, so then, so those would tweak the shapes of those X, Y, Z curves, which would then yield slightly different, um, slightly different uh, LEBs or X, Y, Zs at the end of so the Dave, Do you think with, with, with most of humanity spending a huge amount of time indoors this last couple months, do you think that we will have a different color response on the other end of this, uh, this crisis? We'll all go outside and we'll be blind no, and we'll see red differently? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think genetics works that quickly. Um, okay. Local, short-term short adaptation for sure. So here we have a question that I'd like to address. Is it better to preserve digital images as raw files without color management and export them to whatever color space is needed at the time? Is it better to embed a particular ICC profile in imaging? So uh, I would like to address this in the most succinct possible way, given that it's a very complicated topic. In general, we, DT, do not consider raw files to be long-term archival or preservation grade formats for storage. It is not an image. It is the ingredients of an image along with the raw processor and the raw settings. And unless you have all three of those things, you don't really have an image. So outputting to a universally understood color space is generally considered industry-wide best practice. Picking a color space that includes all the color of your artwork is important. So it may or may not be appropriate to select, for example, a small space like sRGB. It may or may not be necessary to select a very wide one like a pro photo or an ECI RGB. Uh, but the point is that in general, keeping it in a TIFF format and keeping it with a generally understood color space is industry practice. In addition to that archival long term 100 year, 300 year file, having the raw files available with the original color targets you've shot if you're generating your own profiles with documentation or annotations, as Dave was saying, about how and where you made those is also a great value add. Uh, but the file that we generally recommend for preservation is not the raw file. Okay, so I think we do need to cut it off there, Dave. There were other questions in the chat that we were not able to get to. 
I must uh, encourage you guys to follow up if you have additional color science questions. Uh, it is, of course, I think from the very end of the presentation, Fine, so yeah. we would give a good faith uh, response to, keeping in mind, of course, that it's not uh, Dave's job to be answering deep-seated questions, but if you email him and he has an opportunity to answer a succinct question, I suspect he will give a good shot for you. Uh, yeah, I'm and, trying to. And they are available in the case that somebody has very deep and very systemic color science needs. You are available for consultation as a paid consultant. Is that correct? I am. And uh, and also I'll be given a, a sort of a similar presentation, a little bit deeper than this, uh, at that archiving conference, too. It'll be on actually two weeks from today, I think. It's a Thursday, right? So two weeks from today will be the first uh, short course. Uh, and it will be myself and Tom Rieger of the Library of Congress. Uh, talking about uh, some color measurement technologies and how that's going to feed into the FADGI workflow. Uh, and that's going to be um, very interesting. Very good. So, Dave, if you have nothing else, then I thank everyone for coming. I know it's a hard time for many people. We are hoping that you are all staying safe and sane. And, Kate, you may now end the webinar.